And welcome inside episode 114 of Breaking Bats, presented by Not For Long Media. My name is Justin Ayers, and I am joined once again by the man himself. He graces the podcast cover art of this podcast. You may know him. You, you certainly are going to know him if you don't. It is Brian O'Grady. Uh, it's, I've been looking forward to having Brian back on. It's been probably a month or so. Lots happened, uh, but it's great to see you, man. How are you doing? Good to be back, Justin. Thanks for having me. I'm doing good, man. Um, figuring out how to raise two kids and do everything else, but I can't complain. Everything is uh, is going good. I love it. Yeah, no, it's a lot's happened since then. Uh, a lot, a lot of news to talk about. It's gonna be a little little news episode this week because, like, I know we're only uh, probably ten ish games into the season now, but uh, a lot's happened. So, uh, but. We're going to start with Brian's plans, 2024. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about there's been some roster changing in terms of your playing status for this year? Where are you going to be playing and what's kind of like your mindset heading into this year? Yeah, so I got traded from Kansas City Monarchs, where I finished last year, to the Cleburne Railroaders in Texas. It's the same league, but I just thought that <clears> – <throat> It was the best opportunity for me, a little bit easier for my family, too. Um, but the manager is new this year. It's a guy named Pete Incavillia, who played in the big leagues for a long time. I think he was the first overall pick, and I think he was still the NCAA home run leader. I mean, he was big time. Played a year in Japan, too, actually. Um, was on the Phillies when I was a kid. I still remember the name from from back then, 93. Um so he's manager and a guy named Rudy Yaramillo is the hitting coach who was the hitting coach for the Astros, for the Rangers, um, when they had those teams with Josh Hamilton, Nelson Cruz, Adrian Beltre, Michael Young. I mean, those those stacked teams. Uh, he's a legend. So, And the only reason he's not still coaching the MLB is because he didn't feel like doing all the travel. So he lives close to there. So he's coaching that team. So I figured – you know, my goal was to get back and give it one more shot. And I thought that would be the best place for me to to try to do it. So I'm going to go there towards the end of the month and hopefully hit the shit out of the ball and get picked up and be back. And if not, man, then it might be time to move on. And that's that will be all right, too. Oh, but We're not going to talk about that. We, you have a lot of baseball left in you. I do, I do, but there's things – games changed a lot, and I can't help that. So I have a lot of other things going for me, and as much as I love baseball, there's there's other things I can do and be with my family at all times. So I still want to play. I'm still giving it everything I'm, I got, you know, and hopefully this works out and I'll be back in AAA somewhere shortly, but – you know, I'm just going to enjoy it, and and if it's the last hurrah, then it's been a great ride. But, yes, we're not going to think that way. No, that's – yeah, I just got really sad there when you started talking about, like, the end. Like, <laughs> no, dude, what are you talking about? This is just the beginning. This is the, the first day of the rest of your life, Brian. I feel great. I re- Honestly, I really do. I feel great. My swing feels great. feels back to myself after all the things I try to do to make it better that really just made it worse. It feels good to be back and feel natural, and I'm very confident that I'm going to hit like I should, like I have in the past, and just excited to get out there and and run around the field again. I know versatility has kind of been one of the reasons why, like, obviously, well, there's been a lot of reasons why you've continued to play as long as you have, but I think that's kind of helped your case for all of these things, like the ability to play first, third, both corners, center, like, is that the kind of thing, like, have you been working on that this off season to like, if, you know, if they come to you, they're like, Hey, we need you to play the hot corner again. Like, is that the kind of thing where you'd be like, I got you, whatever you need. Yeah, man. I don't, I'll play wherever they want me to the third base, you know, for affiliate. We'll see if they'll let me do it anymore, but I'm willing to, but you know, whatever gets me on the field and gets me at bats, I feel good about playing first base and anywhere in the outfield. So I will do whatever any team wants me to do. Absolutely, dude. Yeah, it's 
I feel like there's definitely there's definitely a, a, a market for people with your skill set, which is like lefty power, play, the ability to play first base. So um, when you get to this new affiliate with the, the guys you mentioned with the hitting coaches, like, are there things that like you're most excited to work with them on or just like pick their brain about certain parts of your game? That's a great question. So Pete, Rudy was, was Pete's hitting coach with the Astros and the Rangers, actually. So that's how they're very close. But all my hitting coaches in affiliate, 95% of them, I've been super close with. And, you know, just I like to talk about each bat right afterwards, like immediate feedback, what you're feeling. Most of the time, you know, I've missed, I've missed that the past couple of years. So I'm looking forward to that and picking Rudy's brain with all the knowledge and, and great guys that he's worked with. Cause you never know what's going to click again and just send you down that path where, you know, it looks like a beach ball and you're just hammering balls all over the place. That's such a great point that you made though, about just like playing, playing overseas. Like the, I'm sure the coaches over there were great, but like, I'm sure the language barrier and just like having, you know, basically two years where you didn't have the ability to have that immediate feedback after at bats, like to the degree that you probably would want, like, was that difficult? Oh yeah, absolutely. Because no matter what, my translators were great. The coaches were great and tried really hard, but there's always just that language barrier. And it's just, it's never kind of like a hundred percent or, you know, especially like Japan, my translator <laughs> would be like about to say it. He'd be like, I know this isn't like, I know this isn't going to make sense in English, but <laughs> but I'm going to say it anyway. It just be, it's just like the literal translation sometimes isn't, it just isn't there. And hitting is just, there's just so much to hitting and so much feel and advice and, you know, having a, a set of eyes on you that knows what it's looking for and just has been around like that is, is huge. No doubt. Yeah, no, that's, you, you essentially were your own hitting coach, which I can't even imagine like how difficult that must've been. So um, yeah, I, I can imagine how excited you are to come over Cleburne railroaders. We're going to be the biggest uh, Cleburne railroad podcast on the internet now. Um, well, that's awesome, man. I, I, I hope it works out for you. I know it's going to work out for you. And uh, definitely excited to see you hit some bombs down there in Texas. Um, it should be a great time. So uh, I wanted to have some news. I had a list of stuff, but I'm going to shake the order up like I still had a little bit earlier. Um, we're going to start, though. We're going to try to send some well wishes and uh, our thoughts to friend of the podcast, Cincinnati Reds pitcher TJ Antone, who I don't know if, if you guys had saw this news. He has to go undergo his third elbow surgery after he tore a tendon completely off of the bone. Um which sounds awful. I can't imagine how difficult this of a time this is for TJ. Um, like I said, he came on this podcast. You knew him from the red system. Um, yeah. I mean, this is, this is just a tough time for our pal. Yeah. I honestly, I don't even know what to say to him. I haven't, I haven't texted him yet. We were same draft class with the reds. So we basically came up together. He is also the reason I have my agent that I have now. So we still talk because of that. Um, and he's just a good dude, but it's, it, it just sucks to see because he, he worked so hard and changed. I mean, did a total 180 of the pitcher he was in the minor leagues to when he got to the big leagues and was becoming like really fucking good. He was, you know, lights out for the, out of the pen for the Reds. And unfortunately, he just he hasn't been able to stay healthy. And it's just kind of one thing after the other now. And um, mentally, that's just really hard to keep doing that and keep putting in all that effort and all that work and then be out there pitching and just it kind of gives out on you again. Hopefully, he can come back from it this time. And we'll just talk about what a great story it is. And it'll never happen again. Um, but I know, I know TJ, he's going to work his butt off to get back out there. And I, I have no doubts that he'll do it. I can't imagine the mental toll that this has taken on him, 
but he, he I feel like last time we had him on the podcast and just like reading the quotes so I have a, a quote I wanted to read from him now it's just like he has to be like one of the best like mindset people that's like I feel like he's got the upstairs part of this game figured out he had a quote that said I want to be a resource for kids and a resource for other athletes going through it so they can come back stronger that's just such a nice like what what does that say about the person that TJ is that after all of these arm injuries that he's going to try to come back and just you know be like a beacon of light for people TJ's always had the confidence that he can do it and he's always been tough mentally tough and he I mean he owns a facility in Texas uh baseball facility where tons of guys go now to work out and kids so uh he's really you know those aren't empty words to him he's he really means that and and he really talks to a lot of kids <laughs> I mean all off season that's where he's at so uh I mean, he's just he's just a great, great guy, and I can't wait to see him back out there whenever it is, you know, fully healthy and let it rip at 100 miles an hour again. Absolutely. Yeah, he, it's I, I have no doubt he's going to come back from this one. Yet, Tommy John's in 2017 and 2021 for TJ Antone. That is – that's just – that's – because, like, that recovery timeline, it's like you you spend, like, two years getting back to full strength, and then it happens, like, basically immediately again. So that's, that's terrible. So, you know, sending our, our, our best wishes out to, to TJ there. Um, I wanted to go to another friend of the podcast and we're going to talk a little bit about Pete Fairbanks because last week in Colorado, they were, the Rays were out there and Pete walked three batters in a row. They ended up losing 10 to seven to the Rockies. He said the reason why he had such problems throwing the baseball and why he kind of had those, those struggles was the humidor. He blamed the baseballs coming out of the humidor and said they were not uniform from ball to ball. A um, little controversy out there in Coors Field, but um, from your experience playing out there in Coors Field, like, ha- do you have experience? Like, do you remember what the baseball quality was like in Coors Field and what – did you see the humidor? Is that a thing? I did not see the humidor, that's for sure. And I don't remember – Really about the the ball quality, but I I'm not touching balls like <laughs> like pitchers are, you know. Um, the thing in in Colorado, the ball feels like it never really. It feels like gravity doesn't apply as much in Colorado, which probably doesn't. But so sometimes breaking balls aren't as sharp, things like that. The fly balls just feel like they stay up there forever. But this is the thing with Pete, and obviously Pete's my buddy, but. Pete's going to be a hundred percent honest with you at all times. He, that's the kind of interview he is. That's the kind of dry sense of humor dude he is. So he's, you know, he's done interviews after games where he blows it and he's like, I was horse shit today. I got to be better. I'll be better next time. Yeah. Yeah. I fucking stunk today. I got to be better next time. So I take Pete's words uh, as the truth because he's blatantly come out the other times and said that he stunk so why would this time be any different if, if he really felt like the balls were jacked up then I believe him I you're 100 percent right yeah it just feels like a weird like stance like he wouldn't he wouldn't blame like he wouldn't make excuses for him walking three batters if that if that wasn't how he truly felt that the balls were not uniform from ball to ball and like the Rockies manager came out and like players on the Rockies and pitchers on the Rockies are like, well, you know, it's his first time pitching here. So, you know, they were like kind of like being dismissive of his, of his claims. And like, I read an article that this is not like the first time that pitchers have complained about Coors Field balls. Like I think it was Tim Lincecum back in 2010 had the same thing. He's like, this is horseshit. They're not, these things are not right. Um, so I don't know what's going on out there. You know, it's it's it was a tough time, but I just yeah, I saw people clowning him online for that interview. It's like, oh, here here comes Pete making excuses for you know you got to throw strikes, Pete. You can't blame the baseballs. It's like, yeah, I don't know. Of course, the Rockies are just gonna say, oh, it's fine, whatever. Any team would do that, but yeah, you're always gonna have the people coming from the the peanut gallery saying throw strikes and all that too. But you know, Pete's always been an accountable dude. He's got no problem voicing his opinion and, you know, had a bad game. 
he thinks the ball sucked. I believe him. <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> that's all I'm gonna say. You know, it's as simple as he'll that. Probably, yeah, I don't understand. He'll come it. out next time and throw well, and he'll probably say, "Yeah, I had some good balls today." You know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah, I saw that. I was just like the comments on like the videos they were posting. I was like, "That's not this." We're just, you know, I, I think we're mischaracterizing what Pete is saying here. I don't know, but um. So there was that. Uh, there is a th- there's a topic and a kind of a trend I've seen in the game in the month of April because we're taping this April 9th. You know, it, the game's been going on for a couple weeks now. It feels like every start to the season, you see like players get off to these horrific starts. Like, who, here's an example for you: Julio Rodriguez in his career, it's his third season, third April. Um, he's always hit like 200 in the month of April, and he's fine. Like at the end of the year, he'll end up hitting like around 300, but. Um, he's hitting 186 right now. And Anthony Rendon started over 21. Like what, what is it about the start of a season? You think for some of these guys that like, they have a hard time locking in. Is it the cold weather? Like, what do you think contributes to a slow month of April for some guys? Yeah, there's a bunch of things. I mean, you're just getting back into the, as, even though you did spring training, spring training is not the regular season. And you're just kind of getting back into the, the groove of, of the season and the travel and just playing in the stadiums every night, all, all that stuff. But I think more than anything, like just about everybody goes over 21 over the course of a season at some point. The difference is if you do it to start, everyone sees that you're over 21. You know what I mean? If you're having a, if it's July and you're hitting 300 and you go over 21 and your average drops down to 285, no one really gives a shit or no one really realizes. But, you know, it's like if you're a team and you, and you lose eight games to start the season, well, a lot of teams lose eight games at some point during the year. But when you're 0-8, you're like, well, shit, they stink or, what, you know, what's going on? So I think it's just a – it's just part of baseball. It's just a bad stretch. Some guys, it is funny how some people are just a little more prone to start slow for whatever reason. Um, but I think it's just a numbers thing. It's just, you don't have that many at bats and it just looks worse. That is, that's such a great point. I've never thought of it like that, but you're right. There is probably this like of a magnifying glass and it's like the beginning of the season. Everybody's excited. Oh my God. Baseball's back. Ew, Julio's hitting 186 and Rendon is oh for like the last like month. Like what why? Um yep. but then I guess on the flip side, why what is it about the beginning of the season that like players like Michael Conforto and Tyler O'Neill and like all these guys are coming out and hitting five hundred? Like, is that the same kind of thing, but just the in the inverse? Yeah, I would say it's the same thing. They just they're off to a you know a hot stretch and it looks even better because it's the start of the season. But the you know, it's it's funny because everybody wants to get off to a good start because everybody knows if you start off good, you can kind of not coast, but it's it just makes the rest of the season a little bit easier, you know, because you already have some numbers. You're already doing all right. And if, you, you know, you hit that little spot where you struggle some, everything's still going to look fine. But – when you start off 0 for 21 or hitting 150 for a month, then you're like, Oh shit, I need to, I need to start hitting. And it just feels like you get one hit and you're just looking at the scoreboard, like shit, still hitting 155, (laughs) you know? And it's just like, you just feel like you're chasing it even more. So there definitely is something to be said about getting off to a hot start and feeling like, you're not looking up at the scoreboard and seeing like, you don't want to look anywhere. They like, go, oh, shit, I can't look at that number. You know, <laughs> so been, wait, is, been, I've been on both sides of that. So I, I get it. Is a, is a slump to start the season worse because of the reasons you just said, like you feel like the weight of the world is on you and it feels like you're never going to get a hit. Like, is it, is it worse to have a slump in April than July? Without a doubt. I remember in my, in, when I, I was in low A in Dayton in 2015, and uh, I started the year April, like, bad, real bad. And, you know, I was pissed off. I was mad because 
I played really well before a couple other guys. They sent to high A instead, like had them skip low A, and I was mad. I was mad that they didn't do that with me, and ended up talking to my manager, kind of relaxed. And then May, I think I was player of the month. I hit like, I don't know, I hit like four something. I hit the shit out of the ball in May. And if you go back, and then I got, I went at the All Star break. I went up to high A, so I was only there for probably like three weeks, but. If you go back and look at my numbers from that two and a half, three months in Dayton, I hit like, I don't know, I think like 270 something. So, like, even though I hit so well in May, my numbers still don't even look that good <laughs> because of how, how slow the start was in April. But then the opposite in 2019 in AAA, April, I ripped the cover off the ball to start the year and I missed <clears throat> like a couple games too. And then May was like the opposite. I struggled bad. And my numbers were still <laughs> way better. <laughs> That's... So you just, I don't know, maybe it's a pressure thing too, I guess. Like when you, it's nice to, to look up at the scoreboard and see you're hitting 500 with mm-hmm. a couple homers as opposed to looking up and seeing like 74 up there and 074 and you're like, shit. And then you get like three hits and you're at, you know, 140. Like, fuck, this is hard. Well, I think it was Eric Hosmer who said one time, it's like you're going to go through stretches through the year where it's like you're going to be like the best player for like a three-week stretch and the, and the worst player for like a three-week a three week stretch. That's, that's, yeah. that's, baseball is one of those games. It's a marathon. And it's like, yeah, like I mean, like Julio. Julio is not going to hit 180 the rest of the year. But um, for some of these guys, yeah, you do, you do kind of need to build up that goodwill and those good feelings like, Hey, this guy's having like a really good year. Like Tyler O'Neill. It's like, is he going to have 500 with a Homer every night? No, but now he looks like he could. I don't know. <laughs> That's a great Haas saying. I'll always remember that. And it's, I think it's, it's so true. It's just who can consistently over that many games, who's just consistent and keeps doing their thing and doesn't like I'm saying, ride the high and lows of, I'm the best player. I'm the worst player. and just kind of keeps going out there and doing it. Those are the guys who end up with the the best numbers and, and who we think are the, the best players. We interrupt this episode to bring you a word from the official sponsor of Not For Long Media and the Breaking Bats podcast, the original Fudge Kitchen. It is a staple of the Jersey Shore with six locations in Cape May, Wildwood, North Wildwood, Stone Harbor, and Ocean City. The original Fudge Kitchen makes all of their fudge in-store guaranteed a delicious product, so stop by and let them know that Not For Long Media and Breaking Bats sent you. Check them out online at fudgekitchenswithans.com as they are shipping fudge and sweet treats all across the country. Now back to the episode. That was a great, yeah. Uh, what I wanted to kind of like zoom out and do the same kind of thing, but at the team level. So I, I like the Miami Marlins. I'm a Skip Schumacher guy. You're a Skip Schumacher guy. They are going through a tough patch at the beginning of the season. They became the first team since the 2010 Orioles, which good God, why? Um, to, they lost 10 out of their first 11 games. I saw that stat and I was like, really? I feel like that was the year they lost. And that, that might've been, it was around the time they lost 30 to three. So I don't know. It was just a bad time in my life. Um, but so last year, this team had 84 wins. They went to the playoffs and then they come out this year. Obviously they've had some injuries to some key players. A lot of pitchers have gone down for them. Um, but I think they, I think they lost nine in a row a- as a team. When you kind of start the season on this kind of a rough patch, like what, what are the vibes? Like, ha- have you been on teams that have just come out of the gates? Like, like super slow and like what is that like in the locker room yeah it's not fun we never had that I never had that problem in the big leagues but you just it just seems like you always you know find way you see, we say like you know team they, they just find a way to win when you're on stretches like that it's like you just find a way to lose <laughs> it's the opposite you know like something stupid happens an error or whatever or just bad luck. It's just everything feels like it's going against you. Um, and, yeah, as a team, it's hard because everybody out there wants to win and wants to win bad. So you just keep feeling that pressure and everyone's just getting pissed off. And you spend so much time there and doing it, and it just sucks. So it's not easy, but like I said before, it's kind of the same thing. You know, most teams – are probably going to have a one and eight, one and nine stretch during the year. Just looks worse when it's the start of the year. And those are the only games you got on the record, but they, you know, that the injuries for them are a real thing that all the pitchers 
They have some talent. Skip's obviously a great manager. I think they'll, you know, it'll even out. But they're – it's just a tough start to the year, man. <laughs> All it comes down to. Was there a stretch in San Diego where you didn't obviously have to lose like nine in a row, but was there like a tough patch in San Diego that you remember? And um, what what do you think Skip is saying to the guys right now that trying to change the vibes up or, or just like maybe what are some of the things that you remember from him about like, you know, staying positive or, you know, just trying to trying to stay afloat. Cause right now it's pretty tough down there. Yeah. I don't think I was ever in San Diego for any of the bad stretches. There was the end of the season. They had the kind of, little collapse that cost them the playoffs and everything, but I I was not there for any of that. So um I do remember we, the guy from the Diamondbacks threw a no hitter against us when I was there. And that was like in general a rough I think offensive stretch. I don't know. I can't remember if we were losing a bunch during then or if we just weren't really clicking offensively. I remember Haas talking after that game. Um but Skip, I guarantee you, Skip's, Skip's saying to the guys, you know, just keep keep working. It's going to turn. You know, it's just, a, it's just a tough stretch to start the season. It's still believing you guys, still all the stuff, things like that. I bet the vibes are nothing but positive from him. And, you know, just patting guys on the ass and saying, we're going to get through this. It's going to be all right. It's There's no reason to – to freak out like that yet. Does it make everything else harder? Of course, but it's 10 games, nine games, whatever. There's 150 left. You know, you can, (laughs) you can erase this, this stretch real easy. What was your, like, is there a go-to Eric Cosmer, like speech in the locker room or thing that he said to the team? I know you weren't there for a lot of San Diego, but, um, you know, was there anything Haas related? Because I mean, he's crushing the media stuff now. I have to imagine there was some sort of pump up speech that he gave to the gang. I'm trying to remember what he said after I I was on deck to pinch hit. Or no, wait, was I? If they were bringing a right, because it was a lefty against the Diamondbacks who threw a um, no hitter. T- Gilbert, Gilbert, Tyler Gilbert, maybe. Luke. Um, yeah, it was kind of a random one. Uh, it was a lefty, so. Like, if they took him out at any point, I was going to pinch hit for whoever. But uh, it never happened. So, I'm trying. Tyler Gilbert. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, I think Haas's point at that time was just, you know, we all need to just have better at bats and grind it out and stop trying to do too much. You know, basically along, along those lines. But, you know, Haas is – everyone listen to Haas. So, you know, that's uh, and you can you can see why. I mean, he's you know, aside from the player he was, he's a good talker and he's been around a man World Series champion. Those are the guys that that dudes listen to, and everybody should listen to his podcast now because it is he's had like Bobby Witt Jr. on. He, he's he's crushing it. I don't know if you checked that it out yet. Good. He's uh, he's he's very adept at the podcast game. Um. Okay, uh, I want to shift gears a little bit. Talk about the Orioles a second ago. Uh, the Orioles might have the best AAA lineup in the history of mankind uh, during their last six games. Which, first of all, why why are they playing six straight against Charlotte? I don't I don't can't figure that out. They scored seventy one runs in six games against the Charlotte Knights, um, and they scored twenty six runs on April third. So they can hit. I, I... <laughs> Couple ahead. things. Was that in Charlotte or was it in Norfolk? In Charlotte. Favorite place to play. Absolute band box. Ball flies in Charlotte. <laughs> but it's just a sick stadium and, and backdrop. And it's a really cool – you ever get a chance to go, it's a really cool place to see a game. Um, they play six in a row now everywhere, I'm pretty sure. That was a COVID change in the minor leagues. That's wild. Life, like, that, gets, yeah. like, that gets old. It does. They it, it does and it doesn't. It's nice because you just it's less travel. Like they that's why they did it. And when I was in AAA with the Padres that year, it was like every Monday was off, I think. And then you played Tuesday through Sunday. So you traveled Monday. 
which was nice because in the PCL, they used to like wake up at 3 a.m. after games to go to the airport to fly to the next place. Like it was, yeah. So it was really the I the I L that league, Charlotte is is wasn't as bad. We never did that, but yeah. So you just do you play six games, less travel, whatever. Okay. They just kept it. But yes, it does get long. It does get very long. Um, yeah, they could hit, man. I mean, you see, you know, a couple of guys. What is it? It's a holiday. Yep. Pierce Dad. Sours. And, Sours and uh, Mayo. Yep. Guy mashes them. Yeah, all. they're just like killing. I mean, I've seen those highlights. It's they're just killing balls. But listen, the beautiful thing about baseball is you keep doing that, someone's going to give you a chance. Whether that's the Orioles or the Orioles make some deals and they're playing somewhere else. So <clears throat> all you can do is keep hitting the shit out of it in AAA and something's going to happen eventually. That was actually, that's a great segue into what I was going to ask you about because yeah, Jackson Holiday's hitting 342, Kerstad's hitting 462, guys like Stowers, Norby, Mayo, like they have, a, their lineup is should be playing in like the AL West at this point. Like they could just, they could probably go out and win 80 games with this lineup. Um, but if you're a guy in that AAA lineup and you're hitting 400 and you're not getting called up, and I know like Connor Norby is one of the first guys that comes to mind. I, I think he tweeted out, I don't know if he was being sarcastic or what, but he was like third season in Norfolk, let's run it back or something. I was like, I don't think you're, mm, I think they're a little, little undertone to that. Um, but can you blame him? Cause it's like, he's doing the, like he's doing everything he can and he's not getting the opportunity. If, if you're in that spot where it's like, you're crushing the ball, you're hitting 500, but there's somebody blocking you or the organization has a different plan for you. Like where, where would you be at mentally if you were in that situation? Yeah, I, I, I kind of did it and it sucks, but it's different for like Jackson holiday. I mean, it's only a matter of time till, till he's up there and he's up there for good. But the other guys, you know, you just, all, there's nothing you can do. All you can do is keep going out and killing the ball and trying to force somebody to, to bring you up there, whether that's your team or another team trading for you. And yeah, 19 with the, with the reds, that's kind of what happened. <clears throat> you know, I was killing the ball early. I got hurt, which sucked. And they called up somebody else instead of me, cause, you know, and uh, I was like, shit, that was my real shot. I thought right there. And I was right because it took another, that was in April and it took another, what, three months, four months for that to happen. And right before the same thing, they called up Aquino and I was like, man, I'm screwed. Like, it just don't matter. And I got called up like five days later <laughs> and, and it was in like the worst slump out of the whole season too. It was like the worst, <clears throat> my worst stretch of the year. My last at bat before I got called up, I literally was like, I don't even know how to hit a baseball anymore. I'm just going to pick my leg up as high as I can and try to hit it over the fence. And I flew out to the track in right field. True story. But, but like, you can't, you just, you, there's nothing you can do, man. All you can do is keep playing. And at some point you keep swinging like that. Somebody's going to give you a chance. There's 30 teams watching, you know? Well, that's also a good point. It's It can't be as easy as like, well, they just have to be patient and wait their turn. It's like, no, dude, fuck that. Like, I'm hitting 500. I want to go play in the show and stop playing in Charlotte for a week straight. Like, I would like to, you know, get called up for the first time. Like, some of these guys haven't gotten called up yet. Other guys like Kierstad have gotten a little, like, a cup of coffee. But, like, I don't know. The way the Orioles roster is constructed, they're doing the whole, like, they're going to have a lot of veterans in these spots. And I guess, you know at a later date to be determined, they'll bring the like Stowers and Kerstad and all these guys back up. But it's like, damn, I just like, that's another thing. I can't imagine the, what these guys are going through hitting 500 and still not getting their opportunity. Yeah. You just got to know, trust me when you're, when you're in that, you're looking at everything to see who's getting hurt. What's just things that are happening because especially in the Orioles situation, I'm not saying you're rooting for guys to get hurt in the, like in the Orioles, but you're just, hyper aware of everything that is going on <clears throat> who's like you know what guys like oh for 14 
and stuff like that. <laughs> but the Orioles, you know, those guys, not Jackson Holiday. The other guys are, you know, if if whenever injuries happen, because they, they always do, they're going to get a shot. Or the Orioles are should be right in the mix this year, right, playoffs and all that. When the trade deadline comes, these are the guys that are going to get traded over to whatever team it is, bringing back that veteran that the Orioles think they need or, or whatever it is, and then they're going to get their opportunity somewhere else. But you can't – they tell you from a from an early time in your minor league career that really basically you're your own company or you're your own stock. There's no – right now you play for the Baltimore Orioles, but there's 29 other teams watching you every time you go out there. And at the end of the day, you're playing for yourself until you're in the big leagues. Then you're playing for a team. But really, in the minor leagues, you're playing to make a name for yourself and boost your stock as much as possible. That's such a great point. Yeah, there's scouts watching these games, I'm sure. I'm sure there's a lot of people packing the stands at Harbor Park checking out what these guys have going on. Because, yeah, if you're a team out there and you have an asset to trade and you would like a a power-hitting corner outfielder, we got them. So, uh, yeah, I have, here's, here's a good flip side of the equation for you. Um, and I don't think I've really heard anybody else really talk about this, the LA angels. So the Orioles keep their prospects in the system too long before they call them up. The angels do the exact opposite. The angels call them immediately up to the big leagues. Uh, Nolan Shanuel, 40 days after he got drafted, called up Zach Neto played 48 games in the minors, got called up. I'm curious what the role of minor league development plays for guys and is the major league level a place like it, it you know, there's obviously exceptions because Shanuel is a pretty good hitter, but it, it should minor league development be done at the major league level like that. In my opinion, it depends on the situation, but I don't think the jump from the minor leagues to the big leagues is just so it's so different. And the jump, from really, I mean, anywhere from from low A to triple A is is huge too. It's just such a different game, and guys are such different players. But I think you need ninety nine percent of guys need time in the minor leagues to figure things out because you you know you're going to have your freaks like like Jackson Holiday or you know just some of these guys who are maybe a little more talented and they show it right away and. You know he's got a he's got a dad who played the big leagues for a long time, so maybe he got a little better teaching from a young age about stuff. But for the most part, man, guys have to learn a whole lot to get to the big leagues and and stay there and be effective. And I think that's a big complaint with a lot of players. I think Haas was just talking about it on a clip I saw from his podcast, talking about how like how Tommy Pham's not signed still, mm-hmm. a guy who was hitting in the three hole for the Diamondbacks in the World Series last year. And instead of I think and I think someone commented on it to like a fan said, you know, like why would the Whites if you're the White Sox, why would you take a bats away from a prospect you're trying to develop and give him the Tommy fan? And the answer is because Tommy's better pay, Tommy's better baseball player right now. You know, but that's that's kind of the problem a lot of players see with the game is that Tommy shouldn't even be in that conversation or like Brandon Belt who had a nice year last year and can't get a contract this year the guys who are really or you know really good players who are a little older have a little bit of big league time whatever like still can play they're just getting thrown out instead of getting these opportunities and then the young guys are getting thrown up there and it's like sink or swim. See if we can, you know, hit strike gold or say, all right, well, he didn't work out and then move on to the next. And that's just kind of where the game's gotten to. How would you have done if you would have went straight from Rutgers to the show? I probably would have hit about 50, 050. <laughs> like a swing and bunt or something in there, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, it wouldn't have been good. Yeah, I just I I'm always so curious about this because like I, it works to varying degrees and like you with pitchers I could see like I feel like Paul Skeens could probably pitch in the big leagues right now, 
because you know he had that big game experience in LSU yeah. and also his stuff his stuff just plays pitchers I feel like it's a little bit different like was it your buddy Brandon Finnegan you played with he went straight from yeah. got drafted went right to the World Series like that that happens and that usually works decently I feel like hitters though is I feel like you got to have that season in a little bit you got to have some time you got to have some ABs to uh to figure some stuff out against big league pitching because it is definitely a lot different than minor league or than uh college pitching yeah, college, it's not even – it's just so different. But it's – pitching, yeah, schemes, you know, you throw 100, you're going to have a chance to get anybody out just because, you know, that's still really hard to hit. But as a as a hitter, yeah, it's just so different. Guys in the big leagues are so good compared to everybody else, where they put the ball, how they tunnel pitches, how they throw, you know, just the – pure stuff that they have aside from the velocity and just how, you know, they know how to work you. There's no secrets in the big leagues. You get to the big leagues, the other team knows everything about you. All the shit. I'll never forget one of my first games. I don't think I got my first hit yet. I think it's my second at bat. Or if not, it was really close. And we're playing the Cubs and I pinch hit later in the game. And I'm like, I'm laying a bunt down. Ain't no, we're down like a run, I think. I'm like, there's no way they're going to think I'm going to – I bunt, you know, it'll be an easy hit. I step in the box. I look up. Chris Bryant's about 15 fucking feet from me staring at me. I'm like, what the fuck is this? So, and like, there's – they know everything. There's no hiding. So, they just exploit weaknesses, and they're just going to keep going at you. And it takes years – for most guys, it takes years and years – to become a major league hitter, truly. Did you get the bunt down? No, I swung because he was, <laughs> he was right there. I couldn't do it. I don't remember. I don't think I got a hit. I can't I can't exactly remember when that was, if I had a hit yet or not. I feel like I probably had a hit, actually, because I don't think I would have bought it for my first major league hit. A little cheap? Been, yeah. Yeah, I would have been a little too too prideful to do that. <laughs> It's like bunting to break up the no hitter. It's like I want to do this the right way. <laughs> yep. Thank you, Alex Mills. <laughs> That's a that was a great story. I don't I don't think if you're you've ever told that before. That's that yeah. I mean, but you're right, because like the scouting and the advanced analytics and everything, like it's it's a different ball game than when you're playing like one PM games on a Tuesday in college or whatever. Yeah, because man, what happens, listen, is in college college and pro is so is is so ridiculously different. I think you texted me about this before and we were just texting <clears throat> about this whole thing. Like you can't, there are so many really, really good college baseball players that never either get a chance, never even get drafted or don't do anything in the, in the, in professional baseball for whatever. There's a bunch of different reasons, but you know, when you're working your way through the minor leagues, like at the lower levels, you'll see plenty of guys who like talent wise, it's through the roof. They can, you know, BP, they can hit a ball 600 feet or you get them on the mound and they're throwing a hundred. But then in the game, the guy can't hit the ball or the guy throwing a hundred can't throw it anywhere near the plate. You know, so you see like all this talent, but it's not refined. And then it's just really like who can refine it enough talent-wise and mentally to put it together and be a complete player. Because the guys you see in AAA, there's probably more talented guys or like pitchers with better stuff at AA or even lower levels, but they can't figure it out like the guy in AAA already has or the big leagues, if that makes sense. That, I mean, that's that was very well put. Like that, that makes like perfect sense the way you just broke that down. Um, yeah, th- again, I, this is stuff that like doesn't really get talked about, but like, yeah, I mean, it makes it, like I said, it makes complete sense. Um, all right, last up for you, uh, the Oakland A's are going to become the Sacramento A's for at least the next three seasons after this one because they're no longer going to be playing in the O.Co. Um, they're going to be playing in the San Francisco Giants AAA Stadium up in Sacktown. Um, so from your, what, what league is that in AAA? It's the Pacific Coast League. Pacific Coast PCL. League. Okay. Yeah. PCL. I know you've played there a little bit. Um, 
we'll talk first about just like the experience. Um, what what do you remember about the Sacktown AAA experience? And be honest with you, it wasn't great. It was uh, it's not the best stadium. It wasn't the best clubhouse. It's. I'm I'm sure the MLB is going to make them do some upgrades, do some stuff to make this happen. Um, because as is, I, I just can't see, I can't see that. But as you know, it's like, it's like on one side, I'm, I'm like, you know, that sucks that a major league team is going to play <clears throat> there. But on the, the other side of it, it really will probably feel like more spring training, like more laid back, more, I don't intimate. know, just not, yeah, more intimate, exactly. So that aspect will be pretty cool. Um, in general, I just I feel bad for, for, you know, Oakland fans. But, you know, what are you going to do? It's just kind of a tough situation. And I'm sure the MLB and the A's are going to upgrade some stuff. And it's, it'll be fine. It'll be different without a doubt very different but it'll it'll be fine i mean the the toronto blue jays played in buffalo for like during covid and i feel like they even into 2021 because of visa issues or something so like it's been done in the past like it's not a new thing we're put them in a triple a stadium see what happens like there's kind of a formula for that um it, i feel like the pacific coast league i feel like the word about that league was just like a homer haven like is that is that the case for is, is sack town because it an easy home run place yeah i can't I think the ball was flying a little bit there, but I also, we talked about this before we were recording. When I was there, there was the real bad fires going on not too far away from there in California. And it was real, like, thick air. I mean, smoky. You could smell it, everything. So the ball might, might have been a little different when, when I was hitting there in terms of how it flies. But in general, PCL is known for the ball flying everywhere. So could see some... Some serious bombs hit there. I absolutely. I have breaking news for you, and this is what this is where we'll end. Uh, Jeff Passan, eight minutes ago, the Baltimore Orioles are calling up infielder Jackson Holiday, the number one prospect in baseball. You know, all, all I had to do was get on here and talk about Jackson Holiday and, and Norfolk, and the, the Orioles listened right away. I feel like with service time, though, somebody said like if they wait until after April 12th or something, or like there was like an early April date. I feel like we're way before that. Yeah. I think we, I think you asked me this too. Like I think we texted back when he did, didn't make the team. Yeah. I don't think, I think the easy low hanging fruit is to be like, Oh, service manipulation. But I don't, I don't think that's that common anymore. I really don't. What the rules they implemented to keep it from happening? I think, it's working. And in this case with the Orioles expecting to be a good team and how good of a player he is and they're expecting him to be like, it just doesn't make sense to do that. So my best guess at the time was that somebody who was out of options. And I think they signed is when they signed Tony Kemp afterwards. Um, yes. They wanted Kemp to fill whatever, bench role like they wanted to see if that was going to work first before calling up him and apparently either he he said you know i'm not going to let it work or the orioles were like all right this isn't working let's let's bring him off or maybe a little bit of both <laughs> um I, i'm sure tony kemp's a great guy i think i've heard he's a great guy um he has started the year at nine at bats no hits um and when you're on a Orioles team that's won 101 games last year, that is trying to win the AL East again, and you have Jackson Holiday hitting like 360 in AAA, he was put in a tough spot. Let's just put it that way. Because um, no, I don't think anybody was rooting for Tony Kemp. I think everybody who saw Tony Kemp was like, "You're not Jackson Holiday, so we don't we don't like you." Um, which is just not, that's not a good spot for him. I'm, I don't know what he was kind of going through there, but um, yeah, I. You know, I wish him the best. I don't know if he's the guy that gets sent down. They really haven't. This just literally broke like 10 minutes ago. They haven't really announced the corresponding roster move yet, but I'm assuming it's Tony. Um, so when you're listening to this tomorrow, you guys will find out. But 
Uh, yeah. Hey, how did that feel breaking a little news? You, you get that like breaking news bug? Yeah, I feel like I need to do this all the time. I could be the next Jeff Passage. <laughs> get you in the scoops game. Jet, um, jet Passing. <laughs> jet Passing if you go on the McAfee yeah, show. Jet. Um, well, damn, man, this is honestly, this has been one of my favorite conversations. I feel like we've had, I feel like we covered a lot. Like you really like your perspective on stuff is so awesome. So, um, definitely appreciate, you know, get, you know, giving us a little hour of your time here and, um, we'll be rooting for the Cleburne railroaders. Uh, hopefully we'll talk to you again, but if not, we're gonna be pulling for the, for Cleburne there. So I appreciate your time. Thanks for having me as always. And yeah, we'll, we'll be talking, man.